And this is VOA One The Hits. Hello, and welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ana Mateo. This program is for English learners, so we speak a bit slower. And we use words and sentences especially written for people learning English. Here are the stories we have for you on today's program. Dr. Jill Robbins brings us the education report. She talks about President elect Joe Biden's choice for education chief. Then, Jonathan Evans brings us a story about backyard chickens. Armin Kasavian brings us a story about the influence of a non traditional high school leader. I will return with this week's words and their stories. We will finish our 30 minutes together with the making of a nation. But first, here is Dr. Jill Robbins. The United States will soon welcome Joe Biden as its new president. The president elect has already named several people to serve in government leadership positions. For example, Janet Yellen is his candidate for Secretary of the Treasury, and General Lloyd Austin is his choice for Defense Secretary. Biden also named Miguel Cardona as the new Secretary of Education. The 45 year old man currently serves as Education Chief for the state of Connecticut. Biden has called Cardona brilliant. Cardona grew up in government-supported housing in that state. His parents, who are from Puerto Rico, spoke Spanish to him. Cardona did not even speak English when he entered the public school system. Cardona started his career in education as a fourth-grade teacher. He became the top administrator or principal of a Connecticut public school at the young age of 28. He says his personal history has provided him a special understanding of the nation's educational inequalities. Cardona was appointed education chief in Connecticut just months before the COVID-19 crisis began last year. When schools moved to distance learning, he hurried to get more than 100,000 laptop computers to students across the state. Since then, however, he has increasingly urged schools to reopen, saying it is harmful to keep students at home. Cardona's first duty in his new job will be to help public schools across the U.S. safely reopen. Biden has promised to have a majority of U.S. schools reopened within his first 100 days in office. During the campaign, Biden also said he will work to get money to schools that are struggling. He plans to ask Cardona to help more young children get into preschool for free and to diversify the nation's teaching force. If the U.S. Senate confirms Cardona, he will replace Trump appointee Betsy DeVos in the position. Last week, the outgoing Secretary of Education wrote a letter to the U.S. Congress to say goodbye. In the letter, DeVos said the coronavirus crisis showed many things that are not encouraging about the U.S. education system. She also said, she will continue to work for students even after her service as secretary is over. Biden has promised to withdraw or remake several of DeVos's policies. I'm Jill Robbins. Now, here is Jonathan Evans. 
Some chicken breeders and poultry groups say the coronavirus pandemic has led more people in the United States to start raising their own chickens. The practice provides people with a new interest, animal friendships, and a continuous supply of fresh eggs. Chicken keeping has become more popular in recent years as people seek ways to help the environment by carefully investigating the food they eat. Businesses that sell young chicks, coops, and other supplies say they have seen an increase in demand since last March. That is when U.S. health officials ordered people to stay home. To help stop the spread of the coronavirus, Allison and Ron Abta live in Marin County, California. They had talked about setting up a chicken coop for years. They finally did so this summer. The couple's three children were excited when their parents finally agreed to buy chicks. These chickens are like my favorite thing, honestly," said twelve-year-old Violet. "They actually have personalities once you get to know them." The baby birds lived inside the family's home for six weeks before moving into their yard. A wire enclosure now houses the five hens and protects them from bobcats, foxes. And other animals that could harm them. Mark Podgewait is a chicken breeder in Vermont who heads the American Poultry Association. He said he and other breeders have noticed an increase in demand for chicks since the pandemic began. His organization has also seen an increase in new members. It just exploded. Whether folks wanted birds just for eggs or eggs and meat, it seemed to really, really take off. Podgewait said. The Abta family bought their chicks from Mill Valley Chickens. The farming business sells chickens, feed, and supplies. It also builds coops. Owner Leslie Citron offers classes for first-time chicken keepers. She estimates her sales grew 400 percent in 2020. I don't think it's going to slow down, Citron said. I think this new interest and passion in chickens is permanent. Citron said most of her buyers in 2020. Were first-time chicken keepers. Some of them are parents looking for something to keep their children busy while at home. Others are preppers, people who want their own supplies of things in case the world falls apart. Demand is just through the roof right now, Citron said. I'm Jonathan Evan. Next, we hear from Armin Kasabian. Joe Clark was a non-traditional high school principal whose unusual way of enforcing rules became the subject of a 1989 Hollywood movie. Clark died late last year at the age of 82. He gained national attention for his leadership at Eastside High School in Patterson, New Jersey. "You are not inferior," is what Clark would often tell his students. Many of the East Side students were African American or Latino. They grew up in a difficult environment. Many of the students who attended his school faced violence, crime, drugs, and troubled family life. Clark believed that students had to be shocked often to understand the influences that could prevent them from succeeding in school and in life. In Clark's first days of working at Eastside High School, he expelled 300 students for fighting, destroying school property, abusing teachers, and drug possession. The students who remained at school believed that higher expectations were being placed on them. 
they felt more pressure to perform better. Before becoming an educator, Clark served in the U.S. Army Reserve. His experience might have influenced how he supervised his school. He was known to walk around with a bullhorn and a baseball bat. Some praised his efforts at discipline, while others criticized his methods. President Ronald Reagan offered Clark a White House policy advisor position after his success at the high school. In 1989, actor Morgan Freeman played Clark in the movie Lean on Me. That movie was based on Clark's experiences at Eastside High School. Joe was a father figure to school kids, Freeman said. He was the best of the best in terms of education. Not everyone supported his methods. One teacher who spoke to National Public Radio, or NPR, in 1988 said his methods were more like being in a labor camp than a public high school. NPR recently spoke to Thomas McIntyre, who said he was one of Joe Clark's former students. McIntyre said, I never really got a chance to thank him. We are your product. You did not fail us. No matter if you kicked me out, you did not fail me. You bettered me, he said. After he retired from Eastside in 1989, Clark worked for six years as the director of a detention center for young people in Newark, New Jersey. He also wrote a book called Laying Down the Law, Joe Clark's Strategy for Saving Our Schools. He described how he managed to turn Eastside High from a failing school into a success. Clark was born in Rochelle, Georgia on May 8, 1938. His family moved north to Newark when he was six years old. I'm Armin Kasabian. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. On this program, we explore words and sayings in American English. Today, we talk about fire. Any kind of fire, from a campfire to a lit match, gives off smoke. This fact about fire relates to today's idiom. There is no smoke without fire. Before we continue, let's talk about two words often used to explain this idiom, rumor and gossip. Rumors and gossip are stories or pieces of information that are passed from person to person, but have not been proven to be true. They are often about something bad. One meaning of there's no smoke without fire is that rumors and gossip often have some truth behind them. If the word on the street is that something is really bad, it just might be. Or if you hear unpleasant things about someone or something from many different people, there may be some truth to it. Maybe. Here's an example. I think we should start looking for another job. I've heard that this bank is going under. It could just be gossip. But usually there's no smoke without fire. In other words, there must be at least some truth to all the talk. The logic is this. If many people are saying that something bad is happening, it could be partly true. We say this idiom several ways. You can say, there's no smoke without fire. Or you can say, where there's smoke, there's fire. You can even simply say, where there's smoke, without continuing the rest of the sentence. People will definitely understand your meaning. Here is another example. Hey, I hear you're going out with that new guy at work. We just went for a long walk together. That's about it. Well, be careful. 
Rumor has it that he is bad news. What kind of bad news? Well, he's been married before. So, it's no crime to have a failed marriage. Right. But he's been married four times. My cousin knows a former wife of his. She says the guy owes money all over town. This is just gossip. Look, I'm just saying be careful. Where there's smoke, yeah, you know. And that brings us to the end of this Words and Their Stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. The first ten years of the 20th century in America were shaped by the strong leadership of President Theodore Roosevelt. And in the second decade, he returned to national politics to bring once more dramatic changes to the United States. Theodore Roosevelt was a distant cousin of Franklin Roosevelt, a Democrat who became president in 1933. In 1912, Teddy Roosevelt organized a new political party, the Progressives. Roosevelt created this new party after he failed to win the Republican presidential nomination. The Republican Convention of 1912 had been controlled by conservative supporters of President William Howard Taft, and, as we hear now from Leo Scully and Morris Joyce, the party nominated Taft for four more years in the White House. As a result, Roosevelt broke with the Republicans, and he and his supporters held their own convention. They formed the Progressive Party and approved a platform that promised reforms. These reforms were proposed to make the government serve the people and carry out more fully their desire for social progress. The Democratic Party also nominated a candidate who supported progressive ideas. The Democrats chose Governor Woodrow Wilson of New Jersey, a former president of Princeton University. So, for the first time in many years, there were three major candidates for president. Wilson clearly had the best chance to win. He had the support of almost all the Democrats. The Republicans, however, were split. Some supported Taft, the others were for Roosevelt. Roosevelt refused to accept the idea of defeat. He campaigned hard, visiting many cities and towns, making speech after speech. Wilson also campaigned hard. He seemed to enjoy it as much as Roosevelt. Taft did not like it at all. He refused to do much campaigning. He spent most of the time at his summer home. It was a quiet election campaign until the middle of October. Then, only three weeks before Election Day, Roosevelt was shot. It happened in Milwaukee. Roosevelt had just left his hotel and climbed into the automobile that would carry him to the hall where he planned to make a speech. As he stood in the open car, an extremist named John Schrank ran up to him, pulled a gun from his coat, and fired a bullet into Roosevelt's chest. The bullet knocked him down. Roosevelt said... It felt as if he had been kicked by a mule. He jumped up 
and put his hand to the wound. The bullet had passed through the inside pocket of his coat. It struck a steel case that held his glasses and went through the folded fifty pages of his written speech. These slowed the bullet, and it went only a few centimeters into his chest. Roosevelt did not know if he was seriously wounded. He put his hand to his mouth and coughed. No blood came, and he knew the shot had not damaged his lungs. Roosevelt ordered the crowd around to stop beating Shrank. Bring him to me, he said. He looked down at the man. You poor creature, said Roosevelt. Then he turned away. Doctors arrived. They said Roosevelt must go at once to the hospital. But Roosevelt refused. He said he would go to the hall. I will make this speech, he said, or die. It will be one or the other. On his way to the hall, he told a friend, it takes more than that to kill a Roosevelt. I do not care a rap about being shot, not a rap. At the hall, he stood before the big crowd. His face was white, but he stood straight without help. Someone announced that Roosevelt had been wounded, but still planned to speak. Roosevelt's voice was very low, almost a whisper. I am going to ask you to be very quiet, and please excuse me from making a long speech. I'll do the best I can, but there is a bullet in me. He paused and then continued. It is nothing. I am not hurt badly. I have something to say, and I will say it, as long as there is life in my body. Roosevelt's speech was not important. He said nothing that he had not already said many times before. What was important, however, was his cool courage. Men did not see his act as foolish or overly dramatic. They saw it as the brave act of a strong man. To the public, he was a hero. Roosevelt spoke for almost an hour. Finally, very weak, he let himself be helped from the hall. He was rushed to a hospital where doctors could examine the wound. The doctors found that the bullet had broken a rib, but caused no serious damage. They decided to leave the bullet where it was. The next day, Roosevelt made a statement from his hospital bed. Tell the people not to worry about me, for if I go down, another will take my place. President Taft and Woodrow Wilson sent messages of regret to Roosevelt. They announced that they would not campaign until Roosevelt was able to do so. Roosevelt's condition improved quickly. After two weeks of rest, he was ready to continue his campaign for the presidency. He made a speech to a big crowd at Madison Square Garden in New York City. Everyone was surprised to see how strong and healthy he seemed. Wilson ended his campaign in New York City the next day. He told a cheering crowd of Democrats, What the Democratic Party proposes to do is to go into power and do the things that the Republican Party has been talking about for 16 years. On November 5th, the people voted. The winner was Woodrow Wilson. He received more than 6 million votes. Roosevelt was second with 4 million. Taft 
received only about three and a half million. Wilson's victory was even greater in the electoral vote. He got 435. Roosevelt got only 88. And Taft received only the eight electoral votes of Utah and Vermont. The Democrats won not only the White House, but also control of Congress. And a number of Democratic governors were elected in states formerly controlled by Republicans. The 1912 campaign ended public life for Theodore Roosevelt. Soon after the election, a friend visited Roosevelt and talked of possible victory in 1916. I thought you were a better politician, Roosevelt said. The fight is over. We are beaten. There is only one thing to do, that is to go back to the Republican Party. You cannot hold a party like the Progressive Party together. There are no loaves and fishes, no financial support. War was soon to break out in Europe. The United States would enter the struggle in 1917. As always, Roosevelt was ready to join in a fight. He asked for permission to organize an American force and lead it into battle in France. President Wilson, however, turned down the request. Roosevelt was sure that it was a political decision. He never forgave Wilson for keeping him out of the war. Although Roosevelt himself could not fight, four of his sons went into battle. One, his youngest son, Quentin, did not return. And when he received news of his son's death, Roosevelt wrote these words to honor him. Only those are fit to live who do not fear to die. And none are fit to die who have shrunk from the joy of life. Both life and death are parts of the same great adventure. All of us who give service and stand ready for sacrifice are torchbearers. We run with the torches until we fall, satisfied if we can then pass them to the hands of other runners. The torches whose flame is brightest are carried by the brave men on the battlefield and by the brave women whose husbands, lovers, sons and brothers struggle there. These are the torchbearers. These are they who have dared the great adventure. Roosevelt's own great adventure was itself coming to an end. He suffered from painful attacks of inflammatory rheumatism and from a serious ear infection. He had difficulty in hearing and could not walk. But the old man was still cheerful. He spent his 60th birthday in the hospital. And to his family and friends, he said, I am ahead of the game. Nobody ever packed more kinds of fun and interest into 60 years. Death came to Roosevelt as he slept on the night of January 6th. 1919. Said Vice President Thomas Marshall, death had to take him sleeping, for if Roosevelt had been awake, there would have been a fight. And that is our program for today. Thank you for listening. Join us again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Ana Mateo.